now for one of people's favorite topics oftentimes in this class, talking about severe weather and uh, some of the ways that it is formed. So this example of a big supercell thunderstorm uh, that we see frequently kind of in the central United States um, that are, uh, can be very damaging, create very large hail, uh, lots of rain, uh, very strong winds at times, and uh, other, you know, other forms of ways that uh, property can be damaged. And so actually for our song tied to more of that damage part um, is going to be for this video more Mo Money, Mo Problems by the Notorious B.I.G. Although we're going to see as we come back around to this at the end, actually my title for this might be reversed in that the more problems we have that we might see in terms of the more severe weather, actually oftentimes the more money that is going into repairing things and we have as damages. So uh, to note with our uh, some of our main types of uh, severe weather that we can look at here. So just you know, starting from the thunderstorm and kind of then some variations off of that with hail and tornadoes and such. Um, you know, the, the conditions favoring thunderstorm formation uh, is to have a relatively warm, moist air mass. Um, you know, we can see this also in a line along a cold front, as we saw in a prior video, and also where mountain slopes uh, cause orographic uplifting. These are all places where we can see uh, are having favorable conditions for thunderstorms. And so we also have a series of stages that are shown over here on the right, you know, how we build up to uh, these uh, big cumulonimbus clouds, kind of their elevations that we can see here, um, and how, remember, reminding ourselves that condensation, uh, when we have that condensation uh, from vapor, from our va water vapor back to uh, liquid water, back to uh, even ice or you know, snow, um, that releases a lot of energy, and because that actually then heats the air, as that um, that uh, with that latent heat, that heat is released, it reduces the air's density, and that actually pushes the air back up. It creates those these strong updrafts um, within the cloud. And so, if you have a lot of very quick cooling of our air, of uh, its, its condensation, but actually that condensation then releasing a lot of heat back, we get a lot of updrafts and downdrafts within these clouds. So up and down, up and down, um, the air goes. And uh, because of that, um, we then um, get a lot. That's where we build these big cumulonimbus clouds. And so these, uh, with downdrafts, um, as we know here, if, um, as the as the drain, raindrops descend through the cumulonimbus cloud, blow the air down. Um, you know, that creates a lot of turbulence as well. Um, so um, to, just to note, also have some in this video some different world records or some big examples of where we see a lot of uh, thunderstorms or you know, other occurrences. So in this case, of thunderstorms were um, uh, in the country of Uganda in Africa, so Kampala, uh, the location within that. Um, so that's located about on our intertropical convergence zone um, that has approximately about 242 days a year on average. So again, our average of, you know, uh, uh, so out of a year of 365 days um, with, with having thunderstorms. So just note that you know, almost two out of every three days of the year, um, you're getting thunderstorms. And we could think, well, why? the intertropical convergence zone, well, remember that is our area of convergence, it is a low pressure area, and you know, because it's on the equator, we have a nice warm air mass, it's actually also kind of in a higher elevation area, so we have some like a mountain area, we have some orographic uplifting even with that, um, we can, and so we get really these multiple conditions that all produce really favorable conditions uh, for thunderstorms in that location. So. Moving off of this, we also have our hail, um, but we can look at how that forms kind of within these big cumulonimbus clouds. So this is when our raindrops circulate repeatedly above and below because of those updrafts and downdrafts above the freezing level in a cloud. And that adds layers of ice as it goes above that freezing level, then comes back down, gets some more moisture around it, goes back up, freezes that moisture, brings it back down, gets more moisture, things throws it back up. Um, so as it does that, it circulates within the cloud. And she goes round and round until the cloud simply just can't, with the updrafts, um, you know, keep it throwing it up anymore. And so you know, the, the hailstone becomes so heavy that it just falls to the ground. Um, and so you know, essentially that the larger hail uh, requires um, more updrafts or stronger updrafts to stay aloft. And so we have this, this formation of larger and larger hailstones, really more convective or stronger 
uh, kind of convection currents within really big cumulonimbus clouds. So we can have relatively small hail here. I mean, oftentimes what we see, uh, if we get it here in Oregon, uh, across the state, it's kind of relatively small, um, not too big. Um, kind of be like pea-sized at, at largest, but um, you can get quite larger ones. You can get the kind of like golf ball size or even larger. I've also noted the world record here. You can go and look that up. I've actually got it in, muse in a museum, but this example, I mean, we had a seven inch in diameter uh, hailstone that fell uh, in Nebraska. So we also get very large hailstorms in the central United States, uh, contiguous United States anyway, as well. Tied to thunderstorms as well are is lightning, and so I'm um, just throwing out here some uh, kind of how lightning actually develops, uh, and some examples of where you can go to learn more about this as well. I'm not going to spend too much time on it here, but just to note, you can read through this at your leisure on the provided lecture slides as well. See the distribution here. So again, over here we had our example uh, that I talked about earlier with uh, in Uganda and Kampala. So it's kind of the central center part of Africa has a very large uh, amount of lightning strikes, uh, average lightning strikes per year tied to those thunderstorms along the intertropical conversion zone. We really see that here you know, along the intertropical conversion zone generally where that travels in the equator. Uh, lots and lots of uh, places where we have more lightning strikes and storms um, and we see that as well. Parts of the more humid eastern United States, southern and eastern parts of the United States where we get lots of thunderstorms as well more lightning strikes in those locations. So um, moving from that, we can then also look at another type of severe weather with our tornadoes. We can see our tornado that is moving out here and how these form. Um, and we can look at this and ask specifically if we actually look at this world map of tornadoes and where they occur. So we have several zones, some in Europe and some a few other locations, parts of Australia, Southern Africa, little parts of South America, but both in extent and both in number, if we were to look at uh, some other maps, um, tornadoes are much more prevalent, uh, especially in the middle, uh, again, this, the, what we call the Great Plains of the United States, are kind of central, contiguous, uh, lower 48 of, uh, states of the United States, um, really is where we have much more tornadoes uh, occurrence on any given year than really anywhere else in the world. And so the question is, well, why is that? Why do we see this very strong density uh, of, very, of recorded tornadoes occurring here uh, throughout much of the central contiguous United States? And well, the reason is that really the conditions that are needed to produce tornadoes are about perfect uh, or more perfect uh, in the central United States than just about anywhere else in the uh, world. On Earth, and so we have this con need these conditions where we need colder, drier air coming down and meeting, and really at what we could term the polar front or at some sort of cold front, uh, where we have both warm, drier air uh, and both warm, moist air, and we get end up here. And because of this pattern, where all of these meet, uh, and, and we have the right wind patterns, and we have the you know kind of this open area where winds can accelerate a lot more, so not in a mountainous area, for example. Um, where, where there's a lot of friction uh, on the ground surface with whiffer winds. Um, with, on the open plains, we get a lot more, we can have a lot more wind acceleration, and that allows for these good conditions for forming tornadoes. So, again, not going to go too much into it more than that. I'm sure it's visual here to show you kind of both mid level winds and higher level winds. It's so usually when you have kind of faster, higher winds where there's a little bit less friction compared to kind of more down at the surface. Um, you kind of that pushing over of the high upper level winds kind of starts the spinning. And um, when we have that spinning, within what we term a mesocyclone, kind of these smaller areas within kind of these big, you know, the big uh, supercells or these big cumulonimbus clouds. And as with the right conditions, with that faster overwind uh, pushing up, kind of can, can turn this um, and end up rotating vertically our winds, uh, these very fast winds uh, that we see. Uh, as tornadoes. And so, um, again, not to explain in really too much more detail on that, there's, of course, you can go out and find extensive uh, detailed information on tornadoes, kind of how they're studied. Uh, there's a lot of good resources out there as well that will provide some links to within our lessons. But just to note that, again, this is really where we see those contrasting air masses, um, that kind of continental polar and maritime tropical. So we have lots of warm, moist air here. And we have that trough of low pressure, an area where we have low pressure oftentimes meeting this as well, 
uh, tied to that pool of jet stream. It's kind of where we have all the right conditions with our flat terrain um, to create good uh, a lot of tornadoes. Again, this is not to say that tornadoes can't form elsewhere. You know, I have an example here where actually you can go look at this link um, where you know, it is it is relatively rare, but for the Eugene area, you know, a few years ago, this is an example of a tornado, at least that seemed to be a tornado um, touched down in Lane County. So you know, it does happen, just a lot less common to have all the right conditions that are needed uh, to produce tornadoes, especially large tornadoes um, in uh, much more of the mountainous and western United States. So finally, then we turn to also our tropical cyclones. Introduced a little bit of this, and you, know, you actually saw this same uh, image in a prior video or in a prior lesson many lessons ago. Um, but you know, noting or kind of asking, um, will, will we see our tropical cyclones or what we term our hurricanes in the Atlantic? Um, you know why though? When we actually look at their pattern, as we can see by this track of all the pattern where we have uh, different tropical cyclones, um, why do we actually see them only occurring at eh, or really being formed um, even though they can track further uh, in either north or south latitudes? Why do they really only seem to form at about 5 to 20 degrees north uh, or south latitude, but actually not along the equator? We know that you know, these, these tropical cyclones are really needing warm waters and you know very warm water all along the equator. Well, first, um, again, just as I noted a little bit prior, um, just to separate our naming out, so you know, a tropical cyclone can actually be named in a variety of different ways, whether it's hurricanes on the Atlantic or Northeast Pacific Ocean, but typhoons in the Northwest, uh, so affecting Asia, or even cyclones in the South Pacific or Indian Oceans, um, we, you know, we give those different names. But the conditions that are needed to produce any of these relatively all remain the same, and that we need, of course, very warm sea surface temperatures, which we have all within the tropics, but also the formation ends up being between about that 5 to 20 degrees latitude based on a force that we've talked about since the beginning of class when we saw this image last, um, and that actually our Coriolis force that we talked about is actually too weak right at the equator, or the few degrees of latitude right around the equator, that there's not enough deflection to get these big storms spinning uh, like they actually need, um, and that will get them spinning and, and, and drawing energy from these warm ocean waters. So, um, and really above that, of course, at the higher latitudes, the sea surface temperatures are often too, way too cold to really consistently form any sort of these big tropical cyclones. So, uh, tied to that, um, where we have the Coriolis Forest, we also need a presence once again, of uh, low pressure and um, kind of providing that convergence I have to get the storm moving uh, and get going and pick up a lot of energy from the warm ocean waters. Again, there's a lot more detail we could go into with tropical cyclones. This is kind of a very broad, um, a very brief overview here. And, you know, again, with our geography, we're a little more interested in the pattern that we see across here and not delving extremely deeply into the process, um, but rather just looking at the pattern here. So that brings us to our last uh, image in this slide, or excuse me, in this uh, slide show, perhaps, uh, in looking at this um, and why we would want to care about this variety of uh, extreme weather or severe weather beyond, of course, kind of some extent, oftentimes from afar they may seem cool, but of course when we know, oh, maybe as well, that when we're in the middle of them, um, they can also be very damaging to property and our livelihood. And so we can see this map here showing a variety of different disasters or environmental hazards that are caught, that led to over one billion dollars in damage. As so we can look at, you know, in some places we seem to have a lot more uh, environmental hazards that cause a lot of damage uh, compared to others. And the question is, well, why is this? And also, you know, as I have noted here on the left, why actually might that be a little bit misleading about the number of hazardous weather events that have been faced over this time period? So you can really look at this map over a 30 year time period. So from 1980 to 2010, this data was collected and, you know, the dollar amounts were adjusted based on inflation and things like that. But, um, you know, to note that actually, you know, it's, it's interesting that some locations like Florida seems to have you know, many different 
you know, many um, damages, Texas, for example, as well, California, you know, Illinois, some of these states um, do quite a lot of damage in some of these places, but then other places, you know, some states, we can see Michigan, Wisconsin here, Wyoming, Arizona, New Mexico, actually really not seeing really any damages at all. So why you know, does that mean that those places that I just named in the, in the latter case are, they weren't experiencing any hazardous events? Or, you know, was, was it perhaps something else? And hopefully, if we actually think about where we're starting to see some of these, um, it's not solely to mean that, uh, you know, where we're seeing all these hazard events, you know, maybe there's way more hazardous events or, you know, way more disasters caused in some of these places than others. But rather, you know, part of this is also depending on things like the number of people that live in these places, you know, and the infrastructure that's built up. You know, maybe part of the reason we're not seeing billion dollar disasters in some of these states, uh, for example, uh, like Utah and Wyoming. Well, Wyoming is the least populous state. There's not a lot of extensive infrastructure built there. And so even though, you know, perhaps if there's very large wildfires there, there's not really, you know, much in terms of human infrastructure to burn in a lot of cases. And so, you know, it's, it's in that sense, it's, you really can't accrue a billion dollars of damage very easily. So you know, that's where I, perhaps in some of these cases we actually end up seeing, you know, not only dependent on, well, you know, there may have been many hazardous, you know, environmentally hazardous events like wildfires, floods, and the like, and some of these other states were not seeing that, but really that, you know, that didn't affect a lot of people or didn't, you know, damage a lot of infrastructure to cause this. So we want to take into account, once again, both the actual factors of the physical environment and, you know, these environmental hazards that we might face, but also pair that with, you know, actually, well, who lives there? You know, what is the infrastructure that's built? You know, these human type questions, of course, are what we're really trying to combine with when we look at maps like this. So that's all I've got for you. Hopefully you enjoyed talking a little bit about our severe weather uh, and some of its patterns in terms of how we can go about both knowing it, its physical processes, but also mapping it uh, with our geography.